Let's get into it. How far is too far? Maybe the first time you thought this was in the basement of your friend's house playing Spin the Bottle, which apparently is an app now. They don't even use a real bottle. <laughs> Maybe you asked the question, how far is too far, when you were out with a guy last weekend and it was almost midnight and he goes, hey, do you want to come up and watch a movie? And you're like, it's midnight, bro. But whether you are a middle school boy figuring things out or a middle-aged woman trying to find a spouse, we've all asked this question, how far is too far? And the question behind the question is always really the same. What can I do sexually that's fun, that doesn't get me into trouble, however you define trouble? That's really the question behind the question of how far is too far. And if you didn't grow up in church, you know that that is still a question that you have to wrestle with because even our culture acknowledges there's a line of what is appropriate and inappropriate when it comes to encountering other people sexually. You know, that's why we're asking questions as a culture of, you know, where is the line? What's appropriate behavior on, you know, how to engage with someone and consent and all these things? And especially when you talk to young people, and, and I get this a lot as a pastor, when you talk to young people navigating all this stuff, it's one of the biggest tensions that they face in their life. You know, like, can we fool around as long as we keep our clothes on? You know, what can I touch? What shouldn't I touch? How much kissing is bad? Can we share a bed? Does oral count? Those are all the PG-13 questions that I've gotten that I could answer. But the big problem with how far is too far, and if you grew up in church, you know this is especially true. The question is, the question of, how far is too far? The problem with it is that if that's all you're asking, all you're thinking about is the line you're supposed to not cross. Like if all you're thinking is, okay, well don't do that, then you're naturally thinking about doing that thing. And for many people, especially in the church, all we were given as a framework to navigate the very real sexual appetites we have and the very real faith we try to hold on to is, hey, there's the line, don't cross it, and if you do, you're doomed forever. That's sort of the message that we've gotten. And what it's produced in our lives are really two societies of equal extremes. Because you've got people who approach sex with great fear on one side of the spectrum, where they approach sex with restriction and rigidity and legalism. It's why some of us grew up in a context like this, and even when you get married, you feel shame because of how dirty sex is. You raised to have great fear of this thing that God made. Uh, one example of this, and this is kind of an extreme example, but up until recently, there were some conservative Christian schools in the South that didn't allow women to eat bananas or hot dogs unless you cut them up. <laughs> yeah, you should laugh at that. That's crazy. But Sir Isaac Newton was right. Every extreme has an equal and opposite reaction. And so we have a world that has extreme fear, but we also have a world of extreme freedom. And this is where the majority of our society is today. Because right now we occupy a space that is the direct result of the sexual revolution of the 1960s. Where the goal of that movement was to liberate us from all of the oppression that came from religion and tradition. And as one pastor friend of mine puts it, he says the sexual revolution has promised us freedom while slowly producing a prison that so many of us find ourselves in. Because the sexual revolution sort of disconnected sex from the things that are supposed to come along with it a little bit. You know, because first you had marriage that was sort of removed from sex as more and more people sort of flipped their views of what adultery and infidelity even meant in the sexual revolution. Uh, then you saw procreation get sort of stripped from sex as modern medical advancements sort of minimize the consequences that come from this biological act. Then you saw intimacy and fidelity even get disconnected from sex as divorce got easier and policies made divorce easier and so marriage went from being a Jesus thing to a legal thing. And as we've discussed over the last couple of weeks, you know, all of this set the table for Tinder and hookup culture, which is where we see romance even get disconnected from sex. It's not even part of the equation anymore. And when you look at all this and lump in the modern advancements of the LGBTQ movement where the male-female binary was stripped and even gender itself was stripped from the sex equation, we now live in a world of radical sexual freedom where you can really almost do anything you want and no one's going to judge you for it. And for a long time, we've sort of held the sexual revolution with great gratitude and, and excitement because of the other cultural advances that happened in America over the last 60 years, like the civil rights movement. We've kind of taken the sexual revolution and just assumed that it was as healthy and important as our nation's struggle for racial equality. But the question our society is just now starting to ask, and the question you and I must ask today, is this sexual freedom doing us any good? Is all this sexual freedom making us better people? Are we a healthier people? Are we a more loving people? Are we benefiting in any way that we weren't prior to our liberation? 
I just want to offer some data points that don't come from Christians, just secular institutions that kind of give an answer to this question. University of Southern California reported that happiness levels in the United States have been on a steady decline starting when? The 1960s. In 2022, a study across 17 countries revealed marital divorce is more damaging to a child than the death of a parent. The Smithsonian Journal reported that the more sexual partners you have, the less capacity your body has for intimacy. While the Me Too movement was at its peak in our country, the number one book in America was Fifty Shades of Grey, which is about sexual male dominance. The more sexual partners you have, studies show, the less likely you are to ever be satisfied in your marriage. One in four men who take erectile dysfunction are under the age of 40, which just so happens to be the generation that's raised up on internet porn. And due to the sexualization of our teens, the number of girls who end up in the hospital because of cutting and self-harm has tripled in 10 years. Tripled in 10 years. Just so happens to see the spike go up when smartphones went into the pockets of our young girls. And now, in private schools across the country, and it's only a matter of time before it makes its way probably into public schools, they are teaching courses called porn literacy, where instead of protecting children from the damages of pornography, they're actually using pornography to help them better understand the roles of pleasure and power and romance. See, nearly every week, a major media outlet puts out an article that says, hey, how we're approaching sex is terrible and it's toxic and we need something better. And the crux of this whole series has been our modern approach to dating is broken and it's breaking us. But at the core of that brokenness might just be a deep misunderstanding of what sex is and why it exists. And I know this has been a lot of numbers and sort of big picture thoughts, so I want to get out of the clouds and into the seats for a moment. I want to ask you with great tenderness and humility in my heart, what is all this sexual freedom producing for you in your life? What good is it doing for you right now? I know there are people in this room who who have been on a hookup in the last month, and then you come out of the bathroom and see that they're already on Tinder looking for someone else. I know there are people who are genuinely attracted physically to their spouse, but because of the, the online porn that you consumed from a young age, you actually don't know what to do with the real body, and so you actually don't even engage fully because of the way your brain's been jacked up. I know there are people here dating the loves of their life, but because of what they did in a high school or a college, they feel shame, like they can't be fully present with them. And I know there are those of you who are doing everything right, and you're following Jesus, and you're fighting the good fight, but all the potential options online make it really easier for you to just want to lower your standards so you don't have to be single another year. All the sexual freedom is not doing us any good. And Mosaic, I don't say any of this to shame us, but I do want to shock us back into reality. I want to lift the fog that culture puts on us when it comes to sex and this liberation we supposedly got so we can realize and start looking and seeing that this liberation we were promised is actually looking a lot more like enslavement. My goal today is to journey with your soul on its way to healing in Christ. And I don't expect anyone here who doesn't follow Jesus to want to do anything I'm saying. I'm not judging you at all. But what I am trying to do is offer a critique of the cultural waters you and I are all swimming in and offer a counter vision of what sex is rooted in the freedom and flourishing that comes by looking at the way of Jesus and the thing that offers us a way out through his resurrection on the cross. Because sex is so often the deepest source of our shame, we have an opportunity today to feel God do some of his deepest work in our wounds. And because of that deep pain, there's a chance here for deep healing. As Jesus says in Matthew 6, He says, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If the Son, referring to himself, if I set you free, then you are truly free. So as we navigate dating and romance and even sex within marriage, we must take a moment to call out the bondage that this sexual freedom has produced and trade the slavery of our sin for the freedom that comes from Christ. So we can get a new vision and have a new way and even experience new healing in some of the deepest broken parts of our life. Now, like I said, For a long time, the best weapon we ever had to navigate sex and faith was, where's the line, don't screw it up. But because sex hits us at such a deep place and because it can really set the course of your life sometimes, we must learn how to ask a better question. We must look beyond what's the line or what can I do and instead ask this question, who am I becoming? If you are courageous enough 
to look at your life and realize that all the sexual freedom in the world isn't making you any better or healthier, this question is the question I want you to wrestle with today, no matter what you're going through. Because it's not enough to say, don't do this, don't do that, just believe more. We need a radical rewiring of how we view sex, what we do with it, and what we expect from it. And the first step to experiencing the freedom of Christ in this area is to have a renewed vision of what sex is. The starting point of this equation that's gonna lead us to freedom is having a renewed vision of what sex is. The Apostle Paul wrote more than half of the New Testament, and in what was probably his first ever letter, the first letter he ever wrote, he actually thought it was important enough to talk about this subject, about sex uh, within God's vision for humanity. And in 1 Thessalonians 4, he says this, check this out. He says, God's will is for you to be holy, so stay away from all sexual sin. Then each of you will control his own body and live in holiness and honor, not in lustful passion like the pagans who do not know God and his ways. Never harm or cheat a fellow believer in this matter by violating his wife, for the Lord avenges all such sins, as we have solemnly warned you before. God has called us to live holy lives, lives, not impure lives. Therefore, anyone who refuses to live by these rules is not disobeying human teaching, but is rejecting God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now, I know this sounds radically different than the world you and I live in, but the truth is, this was radically different than the life Paul was navigating at his time, because all people did back in the ancient Greco-Roman world was rape and assault each other. I mean, it was rampant. It was such a destructive, broken thing, but it was the early church modeling the way of Jesus that built a new normal of purity and restraint and obedience to God. Tom Holland, not Spider-Man, there's a secular historian named Tom Holland. (laughs) Tom Holland wrote this book called Dominion, and he's not a believer, he's not a Jesus follower, he's a historian, but in this book, he outlines why this culture within the church of trust and civility and honor was actually one of the reasons why he argues that without Jesus in the church, we would not have civil rights as we understand it today. He says it is a farce that humanity would have suddenly just progressed to the place of seeing that every life has human value because it was actually Jesus in the church that deposited that message to all of the world that God puts value on you because he he sent his son to die for you. I just think that's really interesting. But Jesus offers a new vision of what sex is. It's what rewrote the norm for the people living in the first century church in a very pagan and hostile and sexually destructive world. And so let's look real briefly at what a renewed vision of sex must include if you're looking to Jesus as the authority. First, we see that sex is not the ultimate experience, it points to the ultimate reality. The first thing to see in this new vision is that sex is not the ultimate experience, but it points to the ultimate reality. The emphasis of Paul in our passage is to live a holy life, to see that sex was created by God for our benefit, not simply for ourselves. It's actually the space where we can experience, as close as we ever can on earth, what it really means to be fully seen, what it means to be fully known, fully loved, and fully accepted within the context of a covenantal marriage as God designed. See, what you're actually groping for in your sexuality is not a momentary high of an orgasm. You're actually grasping for the freedom and acceptance that Adam and Eve experienced in the garden when they were naked and unashamed before one another and before God. So in a way, sex is this crazy awesome thing that God gives us, and when it's experienced in marriage, it's actually a signpost to the loving safety and acceptance of God and the larger call on our lives, not just to be sexually fulfilled, that's nice, but to be spiritually free. Another aspect of this renewed vision is to see that sex is holistic, that it's your whole body, it consumes all of you. And this really flies in the face of modern society because our culture right now chops up sex into bits. You know, it's made sex all about performance and technique and aesthetic. They've taken the soul out of sex and told a story that all it really is is just a thing between two consenting people to have a good time. But our renewed vision rooted in the teachings of Jesus where he talks about sexual sin actually harms your own soul, we see that sex is a mingling of souls, not just the touching of flesh. That's why Pope John Paul II famously said, the problem with pornography is not that it shows too much, but that it shows far too little. Whoa. This idea that even the most graphic images cannot capture the cosmic act that is happening between two souls as they engage in sex. 
That's why those of us who have a long list of sexual brokenness, myself included, know that when you think back to those moments in your life that you're not proud of, those weren't just physical acts, you left a part of yourself with that person because sex is holistic. It's a union of mind and body and spirit. It can't be cheapened as anything else. And it's why we approach sex with such, with such weight and reverence because it's not just a physical thing, it's a spiritual thing. Now the last element of this renewed vision is to see that for the Jesus follower, sex is a part of your transformation and your witness out into the world. That word witness just means how you represent Jesus and present what he's done in your life. The, the verse that I wanna highlight here is this emphasis of putting our control over our bodies, that we would live with control over our own impulses. And the thing is, saying no to our sexual urges, whether you're married or not, is one of the most profound ways to cultivate a deep spiritual life. All growth basically comes from choosing what's best in the long run over what feels good in the moment, meaning our capacity to show forgiveness and to be patient with a friend or do the right things at work instead of cutting corners. All of these things Jesus calls us to tends to flow downstream from how well we're navigating this tension related to sex. Now, I know there are many of you who know this already. You know, you have this renewed vision. You feel confident in it. You're actually doing things the right way. And to be honest, I know there's some of you who have been angry during this series because you're doing things right and you're fighting the good fight and you're running after Jesus and he's not making your situation any better. And I know it's just been frustrating for some of you. I think of my friend who was in a relationship for like a year plus. We all thought she was going to be the one and the relationship ended. I think of the woman in our church who's prayed every week that God would bring a man into her life to lead her spiritually and pursue her romantically, and she has yet to step into a relationship in the last 10 years that was really worth something. I think of the same-sex attracted person in our church who's courageously submitting to Jesus and choosing celibacy in their life and modeling a strength of faith that many of us will never have to understand and can't even fathom. There are those of you that are doing everything right, but God doesn't change your situation. Listen, to those of you who feel like that, let me be nothing else but a pleading encouragement to you to keep going. Don't give up because we see you and we learn from you and you witness out into the world that you really believe what Jesus teaches. Has anyone here ever done a race longer than a 5K? You know, like a half marathon or longer, something like that? Yeah. So the first time I did the Baltimore half, I remember at about mile eight or nine is when I saw those people with the cups and the signs that were like, you can do it, you got this. You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah? When I saw them, I hated them. (laughs) I got so mad. I'm like, you don't know what I'm going through. You're drinking a beer right now. I want to cut my legs off. I'm tired, these shoes are bad, I got blisters, like, they were like, come on, like, you're giving me empty platitudes, you don't know me, you don't know my life. (laughs) And I was just mad at them. But then when I went back and looked at my race time, I saw whenever I came out of being in their proximity, I actually increased my pace. My endurance increased when I had those people who didn't know what I was going through challenge me to keep going and rooting for me in the ways when I wanted to quit. I hated those people and I needed those people. And to those of you who are running after Jesus and you're so agitated that you haven't like learned any revolutionary thing to suddenly get you a magical spouse in our modern world, listen, I give you permission, be mad at me. I will gladly do that for you, but also know we need each other to get through this. I wanna increase your endurance to stay the course with Jesus because how we as followers of Jesus approach dating and specifically those of you who are waiting in the dating is some of the most profound opportunities you have for spiritual formation because you're living with suffering. You long for an outcome that you really don't have much control over, but you're saying, Jesus, I choose you no matter what. Let me be the voice that you need and you despise as you continue to run the race of purity and running after Jesus. Jesus himself says in Matthew 6, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. Listen, to those of you who are single and you're sick of it, now is the time that you get to show the world you really believe this. With your very lives, you get to prove to others that you believe this life is not all there is, that there can be joy in the waiting, and that Christ really is all you need as you continue to cry out for an end to your present relationship status. 
Now, a vision of, you know, what sex is, sex is and, and what you want to do and how you want to get there is really, really great. But as many of us will admit, when it comes to sex, you can believe all the right things, but if you don't have guardrails, things go south pretty quick. And so what I want to do is, from this renewed vision, realize that we need restorative boundaries that help us stay the course over the long haul. The next thing we need is, is restorative boundaries that restore us back to a place of purity as we navigate sex. These are essentially just guardrails that help you in this area and experience the freedom of Christ. And there are a lot of different directions we could go with this, but the three biggest ones that I see people going off the road with when it comes to this topic is when it comes to porn, masturbation, and cohabitation, AKA living together. So I wanna talk about all three of these briefly. We'll start with porn and masturbation. Buckle up. (laughs) In, In Matthew 5, Jesus says this. Anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And I hope that I've already established that sex is more than just two bodies at play. So not only is porn an incomplete picture of what sex is, it's not even a realistic picture of what sex is, but on top of all that, it directly violates the teachings of Jesus. And while many of you who don't follow Jesus will even admit to me, you know porn isn't real, we all know porn has a very real manifestation in our life of dysfunction. I mean, this is the first time in history where both men and women have been raised by marinating their brains on a continuous stream of explicit and sometimes violent images, and it's wreaking havoc on our romantic lives. There are studies that indicate young men experience more arousal in their brain when they see a laptop in their empty apartment than they do seeing a naked woman in front of them because of their porn addiction. Women report having more physical discomfort in sex with strangers and more profound regrets because the activities men want to reenact from their memories of porn. And porn is not a victimless pleasure. You're not only harming yourself based on the teachings of Jesus, but you're harming those in the video. Studies show there is a direct correlation between human trafficking and pornography use. And in the fall of 2020, listen to this. In the fall of 2020, Pornhub was accused of hosting content that involved underage girls and victims of human trafficking. They scrubbed through their content and they deleted 80% of everything on there. They went from 13 million videos to 4 million videos because so much of it got too close to being underage or a victim of human trafficking. The number one porn phrase searched in the world every day is teenager. And I was exposed to porn when I was seven, and I was addicted to it till I was in my 20s. So please hear me. I'm not shaming you if you struggle with that. I've been in that prison. I know how it changes the way you think. It changes how you look at women. It changes how you view yourself as a man, and it changes your expectations of what you expect from the person you're gonna end up with. It is toxic, and I'm not angry at you if you struggle with it. I'm angry at sin. I'm angry at evil and the lies of culture that is dragging us down away from the flourishing Jesus promises. There is very few struggles that produce shame, quite like porn. And so if you are struggling with that, man or woman, because I know that is not a gender-specific issue, we have groups to help you heal. There are men and women in our church who will be open with their mess to help minister to you in the process. I want you to go to mosaicchristian.org slash outdated. We have a bunch of resources there, groups you can connect with, people to connect with to help you grow in this area, because I want you to know you're not alone. And there's a reason for hope. There are people here who don't have the internet on their smartphone. There are people here who don't take computers home at night. There are people that send their browser history every day to a friend to hold them accountable so they don't stumble in this area. This is craziness, but it's a restorative boundary that helps them experience the freedom of Christ. Now, masturbation is a bit trickier because technically it's not in the Bible. But based on the teachings of Jesus we just saw, it's pretty clear that we can deduce he wouldn't encourage it. And while the Bible doesn't address masturbation, C.S. Lewis does, and that's basically the next best thing. (laughs) He's maybe the most influential Christian thinker of the last 100 years, and here's what he wrote, and this is relevant to men and women, and it's a long quote, stay with me. C.S. Lewis writes, for me, The real evil of masturbation is it is taking the good desire of sex, service, and pouring out for others and turns it back, sending the man back into the prison of himself there to keep a harem of imaginary brides. A harem just means a group of women. And this harem, once admitted, works against his ever getting out and really uniting with the real woman. 
For the harem is always accessible, always subservient, calls for no sacrifice or adjustments, can be endowed with erotic and psychological attractions which no real woman can rival. Among these shadowy brides, he is always adored, always the perfect lover. No demand is made on his selfishness. No mortification is ever imposed on his vanity. In the end, they become merely the medium through which he increasingly adores himself. Masturbation involves the abuse of imagination and erotic matters, and thereby encourages a similar abuse of it in all spheres. After all, almost the main work of life is to come out of yourselves, out of that little dark prison we're all born in. Masturbation is to be avoided as all things are to be avoided which slow this process. The danger is that of coming to love the prison. According to Jesus, the root of all love is sacrifice the lowering of yourself for the benefit of another. And as C.S. Lewis puts it, masturbation gets in the way of you learning what real love is. Because you put yourself first and you give yourself control. And again, the question isn't like, can I do this or what can I do? No, it's who are you becoming when you do this? Am I training myself to give of myself more to the person I'm gonna end up with? Or am I adopting practices that contribute to me needing more control and more power? I know there are some of you here who have really unique situations who are married. Um, some of you are in the military, some of you have medical diagnoses, or however you say that plural phrase of diagnosis, I don't know. You have medical situations, there we go, where, you know, there's, there's different things I can't speak to, but on the whole, generally, masturbation is not about service to another. It's about getting what you want when you want. So we have to have boundaries that help us maintain a healthy ordering of loves to ensure that our love doesn't turn in on itself. Again, we have small groups where you can get connected with people and and they'll walk alongside you and they'll be shockingly honest about their struggles to help you experience the healing of Jesus. Go to mosaicchristian.org slash outdated again to pick up those resources. But the third and final boundary or guardrail that we need in this area, especially in our modern world, is when it comes to cohabitation and living together before you're married. And a question I've been asked is like, hey, as a Jesus follower, is it okay for me to live with someone that I know I'm going to marry one day? I just really love them. I don't really want to wait. It makes more sense financially. Can we just move in? Again, the better question is not can I do this, but who am I becoming by doing this? Am I heightening my faith in God over my situation or am I heightening my own control over the situation and really giving myself all the power? So when we look at Scripture, we don't see any examples of a man and woman who are interested in each other living together until they're married. And the one time we kind of hear about it, Jesus is actually rebuking the woman who's living with the man that she's not married to. And this is just Jonathan's thought, but I think if it's not explicitly celebrated in the Bible as something to pursue, that's not something you should pursue. In 1 Corinthians 6, it says, run from sexual sin. It says, retreat, run away, get out of there. You will not win. God's word doesn't say, toughen up and figure it out. You'll be okay. It says, no, get the heck out of Dodge. Don't put yourself in that position. Meaning that 2,000 years ago, God in his wisdom knew to tell us that don't put yourself in positions that compromise your ability to avoid sexual sin. I.e., don't live with someone and pretend that you're married when you haven't made the covenant of being married. You haven't made the commitment to be married. And again, what's more startling to me is that when you look at secular data on this, it just affirms what Jesus teaches. The U.S. Attorney's Office put out a study in 2017. It said only one in five couples who live together actually end up getting married. They found that if you live together before you're married, it increases your chance of divorce 15%. And if you break up with that person, date another person, and then move in with that person, the rate of divorce for that relationship is now 50%, five zero. The Wall Street Journal reported that the people with the lowest rate of divorce are people who got married in their 20s and who didn't live together beforehand. And when I read all this, just statistically, it makes me think, if you ask someone, hey, do you want to move in together? What you're really saying is, hey, would you like to decrease the chances that this ends for both of us well? (laughs) And I don't say this with pride or self-righteousness or thinking I'm better than you. I've been in the counseling rooms when I have to talk through a couple who just broke up and it feels worse than a divorce. I've seen the women lose their identity and be stripped of the life that they thought they were going to have because they, they didn't have someone telling them on the front end, God's ways are wise and lead to health. And so I don't say this to like poke fun at you. I, I say it because I want something for you and from you, which is purity as you run after Jesus. So if you're thinking about moving in with her, just hear me, don't. 
If you already live with him, lean on your family and on your friends and craft a move out plan because that's the single best thing you can do for your relationship. If you love that person and you want to end up with that person, the most loving thing you can do is say, hey, let's take a step back. Or, like a couple I know recently, they just got married. <laughs> I know financially it makes more sense to live together, especially in this climate. I know there are dynamics that I don't even know about. There are reasons why it's going to be so hard and so destructive. But listen, my heart for you is that you would know the truth and the truth would set you free. And I love you so much that I want to tell you the truth so that you hate me and are mad at me, but ultimately I point you to the eternal truth that's going to set you up for flourishing one day. I'm willing to be the bad guy. And the hard truth is when you live together before you're married, when you pretend that you're married, you're actually writing checks with your body that your souls can't cash because you are pretending to live in the safety of a covenant that neither of you have made to each other. There is no for better or for worse. You screw up, they're gone. There is no in sickness and in health because if it goes bad, you know they're probably out. You deserve to be with someone who's made that commitment to you and the person you want to end up with deserves to hear that from you so you can experience the blessings that God designed for us to experience in marriage. We must do the work to put restorative boundaries around these three big sexual impulses that we have because when we do so, with a renewed vision and with guardrails that guide us, we then get to experience the freedom that Christ does in our life as he gives us new desires and a new identity. When you have a renewed vision and restorative boundaries, what you get to experience is a redeemed identity, a redemptive identity. What you long for, what you desire, even how you view your own brokenness of the past shifts because of the grace of Jesus we receive because of what he did for us on the cross. Because when we encounter the love of God and the truth of Christ and live in that truth, even when it's hard, that's when we experience real freedom, not the counterfeit freedom that culture sells us. There's this one time in the Bible where Jesus and his crew are kind of traveling and preaching and all that stuff, and eventually Jesus camps out at this well, and he sends his guys into town to go buy some food. And so he's chilling at this well, and then a woman comes up, and she goes to draw some water, and he's like, hey, can you can you give me some water? And she's like startled that he would even talk to her because she's a Samaritan and he's a Jew and that's basically like a Democrat and Republican having drinks together. So it's a very surprising thing for her. But they, they start talking and as they do, Jesus reveals that he knows all about this woman's sexual past. Uh, he kind of sets her up in a way that you and I wouldn't appreciate. He's like, oh, that's interesting. You should go tell your husband. And she goes, well, I don't have one. He goes, I, I know you do. You've had five and now you're living with a guy you're not even married to. And I'm like, I don't appreciate that right now, Jesus. But he says, I know you've been married and I know you're living with this guy you're not even married to now. And she's astounded that he knows this. And she's likely feeling a ton of shame that he knows this. But in the conversation, Jesus reveals uh, that he is the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the one that they had all been waiting for for forgiveness of, this, forgiveness of sins. And upon hearing this, here's what the woman does. It says, then, leaving her water jar, she ditches the water, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And it says they came out of the town and made their way toward him. Now scholars believe this woman may have been a Samaritan outcast, like living outside of the religious law. She probably would have had a reputation of been with five different guys and probably tried to hide the fact that she was living with a man she wasn't married to. So it makes the shame that she must have felt all the more potent when Jesus brings to the surface that which she's wanted to hide for so long. And the thing I can't shake is why is it that this woman with deep sexual brokenness had a stranger bring it to light and it didn't produce shame, it produced joy? Why is it that the worst things that she'd want to hide forever didn't make her run out of town. It actually made her run, her, her run into town to tell other people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. That's good news. If that happened to you and me, we'd run. Lose your cell phone, you wouldn't even care. Just move. I don't want people to know my deep, dark secret. She left her water. I mean, she's in a desert, and she went to get water. What happened with Jesus that made her forget her physical thirst? It was the fact that Jesus touched on a thirst even deeper she didn't know she had. Imagine being in her position, your deepest, darkest secret, articulated by a stranger, 
by the water. Would you be at a place where you can't wait to tell people? Or would you run? See, what this story shows me in the context of our conversation is that when you encounter Jesus, he doesn't shame you for what you've done. He offers grace and mercy to all who trust in him. If you are humble and broken, he will make you new. So my question for you is, what are you hiding? What would be your thing there at the well? Is it something from your past? Is it something that's happening right now that you'd never, ever, ever, ever want someone to call out into the open? See, the story reminds me, no matter what your thing is, there is no shame too deep that Jesus' grace does not touch. And in just about every instance that we see Jesus encounter sexual sin in Scripture, he always calls you to more, but he always offers unending mercy. The good news of Christ is that the best thing you ever did and the worst thing you ever did says nothing about who you are ultimately because it is the grace of God displayed on the cross, received by faith alone and being baptized in his name that you can take on a new identity. You are no longer the abused or the betrayed or the cheated or the abandoned or the alone or the undesirable or the dirty. You are a son of God, a daughter of the king because of what Jesus did for you, that your shame turns into grace because of what Jesus did on the cross. And it's from this new identity that we can actually say to people, he, he knows everything I ever did. And I'm happy about it because it's been redeemed and forgiven because of what he did. When we do that, we can be like this woman at the well. Come and see this man because he changed my life. And if you never made a decision to follow Christ, if you don't know what this freedom is, if, if you like the idea of this grace, but you, need, you know you need to repent of your sin and look to Jesus as your Savior, all I want you to do when the lights go down in a moment is check the baptism box on your connection card so we can call you this week about what does it mean to walk with Christ for life. But one theologian put it this way, I love this. He says, we all have to choose between two ways of being crazy, the foolishness of the gospel or the nonsense of the values of our world. Mosaic, we choose the craziness of Jesus' beautiful, restorative love. We choose to embrace his vision of sex, his loving boundaries that protect us, and the transformation that happens when we realize he does call us to more, but his mercy reaches us at our most broken. You're broken, I'm broken, we're still gonna be broken, but if we lean on him, no matter what you've done, his grace is enough to give you a new name and a new future and new healing. Let's pray. God, I know there are people here who are just feeling encouraged because they've seen you transform and redeem the parts of themselves that they thought nothing good could ever come from. And God, I know there are people here who just feel a deep weight of regret or fear or doubt about, God, how good are you really? Can you really forgive or really redeem or really heal that thing I'm carrying? God, I pray that in response to this brief time together that you would help us trust, choose faith, and you realize there's nothing your work on the cross can't touch and redeem and renew because you are above all things and renewing all things. But Jesus, we thank you for that reality that we can have this dialogue with hope instead of fear. Thank you for that. In your name I pray, amen. 